Welcome everyone. I'm Vaishali Jain and I'll be your moderator today. And thank you so much for joining us here at NetCom Learning, a market leader in promoting lifelong learning, training, and talent development solutions. We're very excited to host today's technical webinar on the topic of a deep dive in the world of IT networking, part one. And presenting today's topic is Magdi Siffen. Magdi is a chief engineer, information technology professional, and network security consultant with 20 years of experience in IT operations and 14 years as an IT technical trainer and learning consultant. Now please bear in mind that this is an overview of a very robust topic and we offer a collection of technical and business courses that are tailored towards your specific requirements. So if you're interested in a further discussion, you can make an appointment with one of our learning consultants through our website at netcomlearning.com. Now, today's session is also being recorded, so you'll get access to the recording in the next 24 hours via email. Now, just a little bit about Netcom Learning. Netcom Learning is an award-winning global leader in managed learning services, training, and talent development. We offer over 2,000 IT, business, and soft skill courses available to organizations around the world, encompassing all your technology and business training needs. Netcom Learning is the most trusted name in both business and IT training and offers top-notch instructors and vendor-approved coursework offering certification preparation for a variety of vendor certifications. Now we're going to give you a quick overview of the logistics before we get started. To start with, you have the option to adjust the window size to your liking. Simply hit the escape key and you'll find the zoom button on the top left corner of your GoToWebinar viewer. And everyone has been muted except for our presenters, so please feel free to submit any questions you have for the presenters in the questions pane, and we're, we'll go ahead and address them at the end of the session. There's also a PDF copy of today's slides that are available in the handout section of your GoToWebinar viewer. And now I'm going to pass it over to Magdi to present uh, today's uh, session. Magdi? Thank you, Vashali. Thank you so much. Um, today, we are going to be having this part one of uh, a series, NITCOM Learning IT Academy. It's a, a series to start with uh, those who don't have any IT background from scratch, from the beginner level to the expert level. This is the very first part from the very first phase of this IT Academy track. Um, uh, the part, as Vashali said, it's a deep dive in the IT networking part one. Today's agenda is how to be an IT, a successful ICT professional, running the IT projects successfully, the benefit of networking, network components, data transfer, IP address, Windows commands, types of LANs, network topologies, centralized computing versus distributive computing, client server model, peer-to-peer -peer networks, and finally we are going to be having some time for uh, question and answers. So I'm going to be uh, answering your question. How to be an ICT professional? This is the main uh, thing that in today's world, in the real world outside the classrooms, usually the IT find themselves with a very good background if they attended the courses and get certified. But along the time, along the line, it, they are uh, missing something. So there are very, very important factors and some uh, qualities that any successful IT professional must, must keep and must always um, try to gain more and try to maintain. The very first thing and the quality that any IT must have is the certifications. 
there is a long and var various types of certifications from vendors, from the IT vendors like Microsoft, Cisco, IPM, um, you can name it Adobe. Uh, every, every single vendor has their own certificates lined that start from the beginner's level to the expert level. Of course, there is um, uh, Compitia, which is vendor-less, and they are uh, having uh, a generalized um, courses that they are not related to any vendor, which means if you have them, you know the general concept of anything that those certifications are uh, related to. So you have to keep any IT has to have uh, those certifications or those certificates in order for them to find their way to find a good job, a good paid job, and to prove that they know at least the minimum knowledge for their position. And the certificate is not, any certificate is not the end of the line for the IT. It is just stating that they have the knowledge, the enough knowledge to know what's going on in the real world. After that, they will be the experience. You have to have, you have to have a hands-on. It means even if you are a junior in a junior position and you are still learning and you are working with your hands, that's a good thing. You are going to be gaining lots of experiences and exchange knowledge with your peers and co-workers, which is a good thing too. But for those even who are in seniors positions, they have to maintain their experience and hands-on experience. They don't know which part of time and where their hands-on experience will be needed to support a junior team member or to give those um, experience to someone to work on to help them out. If they are running a team, if they are managing a team and their experiences are needed, they will have to have the readiness state to jump in and so and show those people, their junior teams or the team members, that they know what they are doing. And to pass those experiences and share them with their teams is a good thing. That's how to maintain uh, the knowledge level in the team across the team members it's a good thing that to share those experiences and even gain more when doing that because those who has experiences hands-on experiences they will always keen to learn more language skills today is in today's world while we are having multinational companies and we are having uh, professionals from all over the world, language shouldn't be a barrier that can put the people in a closed box while they cannot communicate with other people from other countries. Usually the language skills, and I'm saying that it's not only what you are speaking, like English now is the very first language worldwide, but you have multiple languages here in the U.S. We are having English as first language, Spanish as second language, and it's good to have some background and how to know how to use your language skills and your language tools to communicate with your teams and to communicate with the people and to know how to use that in, in, in the work environment and to use it either through fax, face-to-face, -face, emails, phone calls, those are imperative to keep. And some people, like here uh, in the technical environment, we have like other languages that we need to speak. For those who are doing programming, they need to know .NET, C Sharp, whatever they are coding a language is, and they need to know those languages. Uh, for the IT professionals, we have the PowerShell, we need to know the coding, and we have to know the commands of the PowerShell. It's a skill too. It's not a real world language that everyone talks in the street, but in the teams, 
when you have a work environment, you have to keep those skills. The communication the skills, those are a big part going hand in hand with the language skills. You have to have good communications with your co-workers, you have good communications with your customer outside the organization. You have to have communication skills with almost everyone. And I was talking to one of our T groups right now, and he is a group member, and I was telling him, usually in the organization, your customers are not the people who, your first client or first uh, layers of customers are not those people who are coming from outside the organization. They are your first layer is here at work. They are your customers. They are number one layer. Then the other people will come from outside. You have to communicate effectively. You have to communicate clearly. And you have to build up bridges with those people around you, either in the organization or outside the organization. Uh, the eagerity to learn more. For any IT, they need to learn more. It's an everyday, endless cycle of education and learning to keep up, the no to keep up with the knowledge that every day coming out, not every day, every moment, we have something new going on. And with every vendor or vendorless people, or those who are providing us with knowledge, you have to keep it up. You have to learn new, either on the hardware level, on the software level, on the um, packaging and the cloud level. It's always going to be like something new to learn, something for you to discover, and something for you to talk about and to exchange with your peers and exchange with your customer and tell them what's going on. It's a passion. You have to develop that passion in order to be a successful ICT professional. That passion is going to get you where other people will stop. You are going to get beyond them because if you, are, you stop learning at some point and you will say, I had enough of knowledge, that's where your career as an IT is going to be start to fall. So if for any, any IT professional who learn, who would be like want to get more with their get more with their career and get higher over the ladder, then they will have to be eager to learn more. So those are the uh, main skills and qualities that needed for any IT professional. Now, for any IT professional, either on the uh, junior level or the senior level, you are a part of the project usually. You have a running on environment, either it's a servers or workstations, hardware and software. You have to keep those, um, those uh, resources, either hardware or software resources, you have to keep them running and you have to keep, keep them up to date always and not always that, you have to maintain some certain level of efficiency and performance for those uh, resources. So we are, for it to run any ICT project successfully, you have to have some actions going on and you have to maintain those actions. And in, in the real world, as I'm working as an um, IT professional and systems engineer outside the learning environment and the academic environment, usually I find this when I go to manage a new project or even a running project that they are updating their environment and I don't find any documentations any documentation for the project. So for any IT, in order to have that standard, you have to document your work on a daily basis. If you change anything in the environment, if you had installed a new machine, installed a new software, that's what I keep uh, saying to my colleagues and coworkers and even my trainees, keep the system log, keep the um, captain log, 
it's something like you like the ship if if there is a captain log on the ship you have to have the IT log for you and for your co-workers so if anyone who is going to be working in your environment and they don't have the experience and they didn't attend or weren't a part of the project from scratch then they will know at least what did you do what did you change so you keep a record of everything running around in the project the changes that you had to do even with uh, the update of the system it's an endless cycle too and it's ongoing process on daily basis and you have to keep up with you always have to and that's for the IT bros you have to keep a packup always and you get you are going to be amazed by the amount of uh, investments that the IT uh, industry are investing in and the top notch of those and the most uh, paid for is the backup tapes or storage usually they are the most paid for in the IT environment right now because you have to have enough storage at all times and you have to have a backup storage at all times in order to back up your work so you don't if anything happened you don't have to start from scratch some people will run the backup as everyday backup as differential backup as cumulative backup uh, full backup every day it's a backup strategy. We pick up and choose what's going on uh, and the best for the system based on what's going on, on on the system itself. And the patching. Patching the systems, either it's hardware systems like Cisco devices, HP devices, uh, Brook Curve from HP or Cisco routers and switches, which they have their own flash and they have their own systems. And you have to keep up with the updates and the patching or Microsoft for example operating systems or Red Hat from Linux it's every single system had their own patching system and those who are um, uh, discovering the vulnerability of the system and try to fix that through the patching and releasing patching and the patches that are released must be tested in the test environment before they get applied uh, to the organization machines or the organization devices so they are tested and made sure that they are working fine then after that they can be deployed segment by segment not all over the environment usually we deploy at some limited machines and then we deploy uh, segment by segment so we make sure that they are working fine in the production environment What are the benefits of networking? Uh, benefits of networking are a lot and they are endless. And usually in the beginning, when the network, the concept of networking came out, it was just very old for us and may, maybe for lots of people who are attending this webinar. Uh, it was in the 60s and 70s, early 70s when um, the concept came out and we tried as IT pros to grasp uh, what's going on. We need to transfer data between machines. At that time, it was, it was MAME frames and how we can do that. And you can imagine uh, the world without uh, a compact disk, CD drives or CD writers at that time and uh, floppy disks and the uh, floppy disks were like having little very little uh, storage capacity so the concept of networking and how to exchange data now it's uh, it's very easy uh, the devices that are developed along that line the switches and the layer 3 layer 4 switches uh, we having a uh, lots of connections that we can do that through the twisted bare cables uh, we we have the fiber optics right now 
it's making our life easier to exchange the data and exchange the information across the, the computers and the devices, either handheld devices or other computer devices. So we are using that to exchange data between uh, the teams and the groups that are, wor are, are working on projects or are part of the organization. Sharing. Usually when uh, we had that in the early 80s, we used to share our, our uh, data through floppy drives and then the compact disks came out and it was a leap ahead for us to have a CD writer and start to write those CDs and exchange it and give it hand and hand it to each other. So it was a very good and it wasn't like as a floppy disk while well, they can um, uh, be corrupted easily if they fall, if they bend. So sharing information was at the 80s in that style. After that, we start sharing, we did file sharing and uh, with um, uh, folder sharing and keeping the information in, in some folder for other people in, in, in various departments to work for to work on and that's working for them the best like for example if you are having a design environment uh, and then we are having an engineering environment in an engineering department and design environment in the design design department and we are having an accounting uh, accounting department Every one of them can be having their own file share and they can have their shared folder they can work on using their own log on to that shared folder and start to manage their own work using their own credential and security uh, credential. Communications. While the concept of networking uh, start to spread out, uh, then it led to a um, new investment in the communication systems. And uh, usually right now we are having the network uh, telephone systems. We are having a mail servers for the emails. We are having a communication servers like a solution from Microsoft called Link Server. So that's a uh, a big thing that we are having now to ease our communication uh, between the people in the same organization and people from even outside the organization. While we talked about the sharing and how the departments can work on their file share, the shared uh, folders and stuff, that we are going to call organization and we have a concept called organizational units that's in in Windows environment while we are having those OUs or organizational units well for the people who are working together managing some projects together or having some common um, tasks to perform so that's a big thing right now that uh, we can have and we can maintain that uh, organizational unit work in some place and they have uh, they don't mix with any other uh, department or any other organizational unit so every single one uh, of those departments or all use can use uh, this uh, credential their own credential to to maintain their own work and work on their own files without being mixed with other uh, with other people files. Uh, the the result of all of that is money. For anything that we are going to be doing as an IT professionals or even programmers or developers, we usually aim to I either sell those solutions or to work to maintain working on those solutions so you either making money or saving money now we are like the world is moving towards the cloud solutions so the IT professionals are not only maintaining the current environments but also they are uh, continue to making money through that. Like if you are having your own servers and your own uh, infrastructure and they are very good to hold a solution, uh, 
and to hold a cloud solution, then you can move to the cloud and you can provide a cloud solution to a, to a customers and then you can make money. And there is a very famous example that's going on right now with Amazon. Amazon used to be known as they are just a shopping a portal. You can go and chop stuff from Amazon. Now Amazon are they are hosting their own cloud, and they are provide they are selling that solution to the other people, and they are making money. So now it's not only for the IT to maintain and to save money for the provider, which means Amazon, but all but also making money through providing the solution to third parties outside Amazon. So that's a big part of the uh, networking benefits. Let's move on to the next slide and let's define what is a network. A network is a group of devices. Usually they call the devices like any device that connected to a network, they call it host. They are connected to a central point through a medium. This medium can be a coaxial cable, fiber optics, wireless, can be whatever medium that connects a computer to a central unit. Not only a computer, it can be a handheld device, it can be a tablet, it can be a storage connected to the network uh, to a central point. The data can be traveled through that medium in its very simple form, which usually um, a combination of zeros and ones, which is a binary, that's mathematics here. So it's a very, very simple uh, form in order for, for the data to travel is the zeros and ones, binary systems. The devices can use a common language to talk, to communicate. Those languages called protocols. The protocols are common languages that can be used between the devices and across the network to communicate with each other and those languages called protocols. These are the definition of the network. These are the definitions of the network and how how the data travel and transfer between the network. So with that being said, what are the components for those devices to work together? So the components for the very first devices to work together, every device has to have something called network adapter. A network adapter is now an integrated solution in all the motherboards, the PC motherboards worldwide. So in every single motherboard right now, you will have that built-in network ID, IC. Uh, so the NIC, network interface card, is being built in in the every single one uh, motherboard, computer motherboard that being sold now worldwide. Before that, we had other solutions. We had the coaxial cable or connector that can connect through a coaxial NIC that can be placed in one of the PCI slots in the motherboard or we can have a twisted bear UDP or STP that can be placed as um, as a to to that can be connected to an NIC that can be placed on a PCI slot of the motherboard. We can have the wireless NIC, which is very famous right now. Every single computer shop they are paying. They are selling this uh, solution right now uh, worldwide. Or if you are having a laptop that doesn't, in the back time, we didn't have 
a laptop that has um, a wireless connector but now you can add that as PC MCIA network interface card it was having a slot you can put that card in and start enjoying your wireless connection so with those varieties either from the back time or the current time they are um, they are available right now for the networking solution the network adapters are very important for any any device either handheld device or a computer device those NICs here uh, are mainly for the computers your cell phone has that solution right now has a wireless it your your tablet your netbook all of that uh, all of those solutions are are um, having their own NICs. Now, for the cables and connectors, usually the cables, and we are seeing here uh, a coaxial cable, uh, that's a thick coaxial cable, and part of the connector through a coaxial cable, uh, either a thick or a thin coaxial cable, we have something called twisted bear, which is a copper, and they are twisted in, in what we are seeing here, um, eight wires. Uh, they are uh, twisted around each other, and you have to uh, arrange them uh, and connect them uh, to an RJ or register jack 45, which can be connected to the NIC. And that's gonna give you a wired connection um, to the network and uh, can can connect you to a central point or to a switch or to a router while you can enjoy your internet or you can work on uh, your device uh, locally connected to a local network and starting uh, managing your work. While we are having that uh, type of connectors and the coaxial cable or the um, Twisted bear are based on copper, like this is a copper connectors. We can have other type of connectors, and these these types of connectors came came out lately, and lately I'm I mean in the past 15 years or so, for the commercial use, and it used to have the light pulses for uh, the data communications and transferring data through with uh, light light speed which is very good uh, for the data center solutions when you are having a network connected storage and you need the data to travel with a light speed that's how how it goes and uh, the connectors either uh, an SC connector or ST connector and those are uh, developed by AT&T the concept of them and uh, uh, it's uh, registered to AT&T which is a communication company here in the USA uh, they are different how they are connected to each other uh, either th through uh, a clips around and the square here uh, which has uh, bottoms to release or you just twist them around um, a screw uh, and uh, connectors uh, together when having those fiber optics uh, connectors which transfer uh, the light or the signal in the light form or light pulses across them. For the other uh, other devices that we are going to be uh, discussing here, basically you have to know at the uh, certain age or a certain uh, time era, we had something called the hub. The hub is a central point. That central point is connecting the computer to to each other, any computer. You can have Mac, you can have laptop, you can have a PC, that laptop can be a Linux laptop. Uh, you can have a server, it doesn't matter what operating system that they are running, it doesn't matter uh, what is the provider that they are providing this solution, like PC can usually have Windows, Mac can usually have Apple. Uh, operating systems, it doesn't matter. All of them are being uh, going uh, 
uh, to talk or to have to use the same protocol and the hub is going to be having uh, connect to connect them uh, to a cent that central point and any any one of those uh, devices or uh, as we are calling them nodes in the uh, IT world or hosts because a hub can be a node too just uh, they any any of those can send data to the hub and the hub is going to do something called broadcasting it's like holding a microphone and telling everyone hey i have that message to uh, to uh, someone and who is going to be willing to accept that so we are going to be doing uh, a broadcasting or the hub is going to be doing a broadcasting to the rest of network and the, the other computer that mean that um, was meant to send those data is going to accept the broadcast so the hub is going to be first having the signal from the sender amplifies the signal and then broadcasting the signal to the rest of the network with the time comes by and passing by a new concept came out with the concept of the switching. The switch is like a hub. Exactly, it has the same ports, the RJ45s, uh, patch panels, the panels, and it has uh, a power supply, which, so, which they are sharing the same concept, it needs power, but it will use the MAC address, which called the physical device address. The MAC address is uh, the uh, burn-in address that when every single computer has an NIC, they burn, the manufacturer burn in on a chip uh, connected to that uh, NIC, uh, connected uh, to uh, the computer connected to your phone, it has a physical address. That physical address is registered into the switch operating system. And uh, whenever a device wanted to communicate with other device, it will send uh, the signal uh, or the package to the switch. The switch will be look at looking at the packet. We we call that packet a data packet and examine the physical address, the MAC address, and then gonna be sending that MAC, uh, sending that signal or that packet to the uh, mint uh, computer to be sent to or the mint device to be sent to. The switch doesn't broadcast the messages to the entire network, which is good to the security. It send, uh, as we are saying, it's, um, it checks what's the uh, system port and the other devices that's supposed to be um, sent to and will send to uh, that packet or that uh, signal to the mint to be sent to uh, device. Now we are having something called router. The router is gonna be connecting a lane a local area network or a network, an internal network to the outside world. A router called a barrier or um, a boundary that the network, the local area network here will be ending and then you will have another outside world to the internet the router acts as a center connected device. Uh, it has the internet connection and it's allowing the host to communicate with the other uh, devices outside the organization or outside their local area network. The communication link between the router and the internet uh, is where the LAN ends. So you have your own um, boundary here, the LAN ends here, the internet starts here. How the data get transferred? Uh, the data transfer usually get transferred uh, usual, uh, through uh, serial communications. Um, 
it's where uh, the data transfer bit by bit, zeros and ones, in a series, series matter. It's serial transfer, it's go bit by bit from a sender to a receiver. And we call that uh, a single bit stream. While we are streaming um, the signals uh, into bits through the communication link. How this is going to be transferred? This is going to be transferred through a broadcasting while a broadcasting uh, as in the hub uh, if the data will be sent to every single host or every single computer or every single device over the network while we are having something else called the unicasting while the data can be sent to one host only which is uh, what's going on and what's uh, implemented right now in most of the networks so it's secured and it's better to have than any other uh, broadcasting solution and the data transfer used to have a rate and the rate usually with the data transfer it's um, bits per second and that's how the internet uh, even providers I uh, internet service providers are using for their own uh, uh, rates the data transfer rates is not by megabit by megabytes it's by megabits per second so uh, it's a lower case and you can you can see either it's going to be bits per second or megabits per second while if you get um if you got a hard disk drive and you have uh the capital mp that means it's megabyte that's for storage while in the data transfer usually for the speed for the data transmitted across the network or across the devices it's in megabits per second we talked about the protocols and how the protocols uh is the um how the concept of protocols is uh, is the uh, what's govern the communications between devices over the network so one of the one of the protocols and the set of rules the protocol is a set of rules that govern those communications the ethernet is a set of rules that governing the transmission of the data between the network adapters and other uh, other communication devices either routers or whatever um, switches hubs all of them must have this, the compatible Ethernet protocol in order for them to communicate uh, most of the uh, common um, Ethernet protocols are the 802 the point three U, which is the fast Ethernet that govern the data traveling over the network um, by uh, mega bits per second, or uh, by one hundred megs, one hundred mega bits per second, or the uh, eight o two point three AP, which is uh, called a giga Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet and it runs at uh, 1000 megabits per second so those are the most very uh, common uh, ethernet protocols that govern the data transfer and uh, how how they are uh, traveling across the network The IP address, the concept of IP address is the address that uh, given to a device over the network. So it's like your home address, your mailbox address. When someone sent you something, it will go to your mailbox and then you can receive those. The IP address is 32-bit address, that's what we call it. It's divided in two uh, it divided into four sections or four four portions. Uh, those four portions usually we call them octets. So every every one of them is eight bits. Uh, the most common um, worldwide uh, 
IP address classes is A, B, C, D, E. Those are classes, and every single class has a unique range. In order to know the class and how they are uh, uh, having their own setup, the class A can host hosts uh, from 1 to uh, 126, and what we call here, uh, it has something called the um, subnet mask, and the subnet mask has a network portion and then host portions. So it's 2255.0.0.0, that's uh, starting off the class A subnet mask. The class B subnet mask it hosts uh, from 128 to 191, and it has two network portions and two host portions. So the network octets and network octets is going to be 255, 200 to 55, and then the hosts are going to be starting by a zeros and zeros. Class C, which which most of the people are using right now uh, in their internal network, uh, is going to be uh, 192 until through 223, and it has the network octets 255, 255, 255, and zero, which is the host octet. Those are the most common three in the classes, and those are what I'm going to be covering in this webinar. More can be learned through uh, in-details courses. What are the special IP addresses? The special IP addresses uh, you can find here is 127.0.0.0. Uh, That's a network address reserved for the loopback for the same computer that you are working on. And that address is, if you are going to be ever test the conductivity of the same computer and knowing that computer has a working NIC. You can usually test that through this address 127.0.0.1. Well, uh, there are reserved private use for private use addresses. For class A, we have 10.0.0.0 uh, and 210.2525, uh, 25, 25, 25, those are IP address ranges, 172.16.0.0 .0 .0 to 172.16.0.0. .0 .0. Two fifty five two point two fifty five that's for class B for class C it's one ninety two point one sixty eight point zero point zero two um one ninety two point uh one sixty eight point twenty five two two hundred twenty five fifty five and two hundred fifty five those you can can any IP uh, of those uh, ranges uh, can use for the internal use and private use uh, in any other organization they are not published over the internet and they are not public so you can use it for uh, for those uh, private network and usually routers will filter those uh, those, those uh, IP address ranges and prevent them from being um, propagated to the internet. The subnet mask is going hand in hand uh, with the IP address and the subnet mask is uh, what uh, is telling what the computer or the, the device which network they are belongs to or a member of. So a uh, subnet mask is uh, a big part of this and um, all the 20, uh, 252, 55, sorry, uh, in the subnet mask collectively refer to a network portion, uh, whereas the zeros refer to a host portion, as I explained in the IP address. And that's an example here. You have the IP address of class C, uh, 192 point, uh, the second octet is going to be 186, and the third octet is going to be 1 and 1, and that's uh, a subnet mask has a subnet mask 
255, 255, 255, and of course the uh, the fourth octet is going to be zero. That's going to be telling uh, the computers that they are connected to a class C network or class C lane. What are the Windows commands that we can be using and uh, that's one of the things that I would like to uh, use the uh, CMD uh, to explain uh, which is uh, I can give that to um, Here's the CMD, and I have I will be using uh, the very first uh, command, which is the Bing, uh, the IP config command. That's how to get to recognize the IP configuration on your own uh, physical machine or virtual machine. It doesn't matter. It's a, a Windows command that I can be using uh, in order to to show uh, the IP configuration. So if I wrote IP config as one word and then it will give me the Ethernet adapter and it will give me the IP address version 6 if it's implemented, the IP address version 4, the subnet mask and the default gateway which is uh, 192.168.20 180, and dot one. That's the very first uh, IB configuration and maybe maybe some other uh, devices or uh, any other adapters are connected to the same machine or the same computer, but uh, that's a Windows command that we're going to show you the, the rules of the IP addresses on the same machine. Now, uh, I'd like also to show you other command which is going to be the Bing command and let's use for example Yahoo as a destination to Bing and of course here the computer has sent um, packets in order to test the communications between the local host with the computer that we are working on and they are sending uh, 32 bytes of data and they are going to be uh, sending that uh, to an IP address of the yahoo.com uh, website uh, or the server that hosts the website and then it's going to be like giving us the time and the time to live to return those packages, the packets are sent are four, the received back are four, there is no lost, so zero loss, the approximately a round trip in milliseconds are uh, 12 milliseconds, the, mix, the maximum are the same, the average uh, is the same of course. So those are uh, the most common commands that we can uh, use and we can uh, usually work on if we uh, if we are going to be testing these commands. What are the types of networking? The type of networks we can have the wired network which is uh, having the computers and uh, the devices are connected through uh, switches and um, as a central point and those switches are connect those wired connected through wired either UTB or uh, other uh, STPs for example which is a shielded twisted bear that connects the computers together and those are what we called wired and it's a, they are based, uh, the, the base of the connection usually is the twisted bear UTP. UTP. Uh, while on the uh, wireless side we can use the network uh, devices can be using the air or the wireless connection through the wireless access point. So those are uh, can be uh, called WAP, wireless access points, and they are acting as a central point to distribute the signal uh, to the other devices and other handheld devices so they can connect to the internet or to uh, a local area network. 
what are the VLANs? VLANs concept that having a multiple machines connected to segments physically, and they are connected to a hub or switch as a central connection point, and they are uh, maybe in, not in the same place, not in the same room, not on the same floor in the environment, but they are having that um, logical the, those distribution of the data between them as one lane. So it's going to be like virtual lane A that are having computer from the same re, uh, addresses, range, uh, subnet masks and stuff like that. They are working as one unit despite they are not together in the same location but they are working in the same normal fashion as they as they are if they are working in the same location uh, I'm gonna be discussing the network topologies uh, they are gonna be uh, the main ones here and how the, the topology is how to describe the network and the physical connections between the network it compare so I'm gonna be discussing the uh, star topology the star topology in very simple uh, uh, definition has has a central connection and every single computer connected to that central connection unit which is going to be usually a, a switch and uh, in the modern time that it is a switch not a um, not a hub and uh, every single computer is going to be sending uh, those uh, signals to that switch and that switch is going to be distributing the signal back and forth. We are having a SUHO switch or a hub, and um, that switch is connected uh, through a twisted bare cabling. The mesh connection doesn't have a central point, rather has um, every single computer connected to another computer uh, without a central point. The ring topology is usually having an MAU device that connect it's a, logically, physically as a star and logically uh, connected uh, as a ring, which means the data is traveling around in a ring pattern, but they are connected also through uh, a central unit called MAU or uh, as we used to call it, multi-axis unit or multi-station axis unit. What is the centralized computing? The centralized computing started with IPM uh, in uh, the 60s of the 19th century uh, when they invented something called the mainframe. Uh, the mainframe or the centralized computer is usually a supercomputer uh, the other uh, terminals which the people can work on that silver computer, they usually have a monitor and a keyboard, which we can call them a dump terminal. Those are dump terminal, they don't have their own storage, they don't have anything that in the modern computers that they have, rather than just connected to that supercomputer and use the capability and resources uh, and logistics of this supercomputer. Uh, they don't have RAM, they don't have a processor, they don't have anything that help the, that dumb terminal to work by itself. The distributive computer, uh, rather than uh, and very opposite to, uh, to the uh, pattern of the supercomputer or the mainframe, in every single unit connected to uh, the network that has their own processing power, that has their own storage, it has their own RAM, so it's a standalone, it can perform work alone, and can perform, it has their own resources to work on. That uh, distributive computing um, concept is usually what we are calling uh, a peer-to-peer -peer or server-client pattern or model, both of them are using the concept of distributing computer. Even your handheld device right now is the same thing. So uh, uh, with that being said, we are going to be uh, jumping into the client-server model while we are having that model as uh, one uh, computer that has one or multiple computers that has uh, enough resources, a bigger resources than the other computer uh, computers connected to, to it and can provide uh, software services 
or services to the other computers connected to it and we are saying that they are uh, sharing the resources uh, the operating systems uh, what we called networked operating systems. Right now, the most advanced uh, server operating systems or network network operating system is Windows uh, 2016 uh, for the server side, and of course for the client side for the other computer, uh, Windows 8 uh, and Windows 10. Uh, Magdi, I just wanted yeah. to give you a heads up. I'm sorry, it is 2 p.m. Okay, uh, we are uh, approaching uh, the last slide or the last sli last couple of slides. Type type of servers are file servers, which can provide file uh, file services, print servers, web services like uh, Yahoo.com, for example, or Microsoft.com. All of them has uh, usually a database. Those web servers have database hosted on them. Um, fax servers, telephone servers, um, the peer-to-peer -peer network, it's while the computers are having uh, their own processing, uh, they are having limited resources and those resources can be used for file sharing and uh, co communications, but unlike the servers, every single user has to have their own backup strategy, they are responsible for all their machines, and uh, how to run uh, the resources of the local computer and uh, the computers are limited to 10 computers usually and the security considerations of those peer-to-peer -peer network uh, are just the minimum when we are having some security concerns. We are now accepting questions so please uh, if you have any questions uh, let me uh, know and I can answer them for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie. That was a very informative. Um, before we get to the questions, I just wanted to let everyone know we have a special promotion for the recommended courses for this webinar. Enroll yourself for the courses mentioned on your screen and add 15% to your savings. You can avail the discount using the promo code that you see on your screen, and this offer is valid till May 24th, 2017. We're also going to be launching a quick poll to find out how many people might be interested in taking up some additional training. We also have many more webinars coming up, so please go to netcomlearning.com slash webinars to register and follow our social media pages to get the latest technology updates. And you can uh, refer to the GoToWebinar chat window for the links. Now, in terms of the questions, um, master's degree versus certification for certification, which is better if I had to choose one? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for answering the for asking this question. Uh, for for someone who is uh, proceeding with their postgraduate uh, studies, a uh, master's degree is having a great weight in the academic field. Uh, that's a good thing. If you are going to proceed with your academic uh, work and stuff, and when you applying for jobs, it's a good thing. A master's degree doesn't have usually the varieties and the hands-on experience that can pass through the course. You are going to go through references and uh, go through um, trainings, but it's, it is not a vendor-based thing. It's not going to be telling you go to um, Microsoft solution or Cisco solution. You will be informed to choose, yes, but they are compl completing each other. Uh, it's uh, part of the tools. Master's degree is part of your tools. It, it's like you are a handyman and you are having um, a, a toolbox. You have the master's degree and you have your certifications. Both of them helped. When I was studying in the college, I had my degree, my, my bachelor's degree, that's personal experience, and I had my certifications when I went to the postgraduate. I was given credits for my certifications in the master's program. So it's it's not very difficult to choose. They are completing each other. Uh, depends on the person uh, preferences if they are wanting to get into the work environment uh, very fast. Uh, usually certifications 
uh, certificates are easier pass, shorter pass, not easier. I will say shorter pass. Uh, you can have uh, your certificate as, for example, Microsoft Certified Solution Expert in like three months. While master's degree, you have to follow academic, some academic uh, procedures in order to get into the master's and have your degree and then uh, go to the work um, environment. It's different, but both of them are important and uh, being part uh, of the IT community, as we uh, illustrated, eagerly to learn more, no matter what the path is, whatever you choose, be eager and be uh, armed with that knowledge, no matter uh, what the knowledge uh, is coming from, masters, certifications, exams, readings, Eager to learn more is the key here. Okay. Okay, great. And um, there's one more question here, um, and that is, how does one, how does someone get IT work experience when no one will hire them because they don't have any? Okay, uh, IT work experience not usually uh, getting through easily getting done. Like you are not going to be going there, apply for work, and then you get accepted while you don't know anything. Usually I will recommend, and that's something that I do for my students and my co-workers even, to do some research as a volunteer. Go help. Sometimes the volunteer work can be paid, sometimes are not paid, um, but it doesn't matter. You will gain experience through that. Go help your friends, install systems for them. Um, go help your family members. You will gain some experience. Although those cannot be count in your resume, but if you did some volunteer work, it will definitely count as part of your uh, experiences and it will say something about you that you are willing to help, and not only that, that you are good enough, your help was 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 valuable for other people, so they took your uh, your uh, knowledge and your experiences, and you will earn more through the volunteer. You will have someone who is uh, having more experiences than you are, and they will pass that experiences with you. They will share it with you. Okay. So great. that's a part of it. Thank you, Maggie, and thank you all for joining us today. If you do have any other additional questions, feel free to send them to webinar at netcomlearning.com at any time. We hope you found today's webinar informative, and we look forward to seeing you back here with us soon. Feel free to tell your friends and colleagues about our webinars and other courses, and again, Maggie, thank you for that very informative session, and everyone, we'll have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. You. Thank you. And I have uh, I have like an announcement. After two weeks, we can have uh, another part of this webinar, the second part of this webinar. Uh, so uh, mark your calendar. It's going to be May 23rd for the second part of the deep dive in the IT networks world. Uh, I'd like to give thanks uh, to Sweda, Sarah, Garov, Ben, Ankna, and for you. Ms. Vashali, and also I have a special thanks to uh, Chief Engineer Mina Henry from IPM Germany. Thank you so much for joining me today, and uh, hopefully I'm going to be seeing you after two weeks. Thank you. Thank you.